Okay, so now let's get this puppy going. Obviously the first thing we need to do is measure our room. And we need to do this at least once with every pair of monitors we want to use in our studio. So you've got three pairs you like to switch between, then we need at least three sets of measurements. I say at least because you can make as many measurements as you like for each set of monitors. You might do this for a few reasons, but one might be to have a setting that's really accurate right at the back of your room on your client couch, where normally the bottom end, say, might gather and boom, and then a separate one at your core mixing position. Now before we launch any software, we need to get the supplied microphone connected correctly, and the process will differ slightly from rig to rig, depending on your setup. Put as simply as possible, you need to hook the microphone up to some sort of mic preamp, and have that preamp feed your sound card. And your system and audio drivers need to be set up in such a way that they can simultaneously record audio that's playing back. Now that sentence will become more clear in a moment. Now keep in mind that in some cases the preamp is part of your sound card setup, such as in things like the DigiDesign M boxes or 002 and 003 systems. Of course there's hundreds of other equivalents, I only mention DigiDesign because they're probably the most ubiquitous system. If your sound card doesn't contain mic pre's, then you need to connect the mic to an external mic pre and feed that to your sound card. Either way, the end result is the same. As long as you can phantom power the mic, all will be good. In their manual, IK recommends that the preamp be as clean as possible and actually urge against using tube preamps. I guess this depends. Higher end tube preamps are often exceptionally clean, but in fairness IK are more concerned about the low end tube stuff that distorts easily and early. So if this is all you've got, my advice here would be to be really conservative with your levels on cheap tube gear, and hopefully you can keep it out of the bad zone. More on levels in a little while. Now a few more caveats. You must be using a high quality audio interface that can operate at 48k. Now don't get too freaked out by the term high quality. Your average low hundreds of dollars type of interface would still qualify as being high quality. Arc supports core audio drivers for the Mac and ASIO drivers for Windows. The measurement software will switch your system to 48k so the sample rate must not be locked to something else. So with that out of the way and your mic and interface all set up and ready to go, let's launch the measurement application. On the Mac, You'll find it in the Applications folder. On Windows, go to your Start menu, then to Programs, and launch it from there. In my case here, I've made an alias of it from the Applications folder, and it's sitting there on my desktop. So let's launch the application now. Now the first job we have to do is choose which of the two microphones came with our system, as we discussed in the first movie. Now as I said, there's no better or worse here. It's not like the later model one is better, it's just that the two differ slightly in response and the software needs to know which one you're using ahead of time. They both do an equally good job for this task. Now in my case, I've got the one on the right with the little orange band around it here. So I'm gonna check that one. And we can move on to the next screen. Now this is just a welcome screen. Welcome to Arc System. This program will guide you through the measurement and correction calculation for your room. So that's step one. Well, actually, step one was choosing the microphone, and now we're getting welcomed, so we'll say next. Now here's where we set up the specifics of our audio system. Now I can't predict exactly what's going to happen in your world not knowing your system, but hopefully looking at mine will give you an idea of what to expect. So here it's telling me that my audio hardware is DigiDesign HD hardware. If I click here I get no other options, of course, that's all I've got. Now we have to set the left and right outputs of our system. So in my case, it's actually not 1 and 2, because I'm using an icon-based system here which uses DigiDesign's Xmon audio interface. So, as odd as it seems, I actually don't want 1 and 2, I want 1 and 5. So I'll go down there and choose 5 as my right channel. And in my case, the mic is coming up on input 1. And this just reflects my interface, which has, in this case, 8 analog inputs. So I'm coming back on number 1, after going through a mic preamp, as discussed. So it looks like we're set up there, we're ready to move on to step three. Now that little pause there was because DigiDesign's core audio drivers had to launch themselves, they wouldn't have been automatically launched. If I go to my application selector now, we can see over here that core audio has launched itself. And for those not familiar with DigiDesign core audio, the default preferences are usually fine. In this case you can see it's connected at 48k, so it's actually the Arc software that would have forced it to 48k, which is fine. The default buffer size of 512 seems to work for me, so I'm not going to touch it. If you have problems, maybe you have to deal with those independently. If I go to the prefs here, I could have actually set here, in my case, use Xmon stereo routing, left, right to 1 and 5, but I've done it manually. But for the sake of completeness, in my case, I will set that preference on. And those of you with other preferences that might be relevant here, like 002, 003 things there, maybe you need to check that as well. 
So let's get out of there and I'll just leave that open in the background and we're on. Now you can see this movement here as I'm talking. That's actually the ARC microphone picking up my voice, but this is what we're about to get to now. Not my voice, but tones. Now what we need to do here is a fairly delicate little balancing act. It's not actually that hard, but there's a few steps involved. And what we're about to do is just set up the levels to capture the tones that are going to be put through the speakers most accurately. Now at the moment, keep your monitoring level down, your actual control room level down, because some tones are going to come out. You don't know how loud they're going to be, so let's just play it safe. In this case, my monitoring is quite soft, not completely off, but quite soft. Now I'm going to click on this button here saying play test and I need to do a little juggling act between my mic preamps input gain and the actual volume in my control room because that's what's going to feed the mic through the speakers. So you'll get what I mean in a second. I've actually got the gain on the mic preamp at a reasonable level so it'll be a pretty good guess already I think. And just one more thing, the correct orientation for this mic is pointing straight up to the roof. So completely vertical pointing up at the roof. It's an Omni mic so it's picking up from every angle. So just put it in your main monitoring position, right in the center, pointing up at the roof. I'm going to hit play test now. And you might be able to just hear that coming through very softly in the speakers. I'm going to turn it up now, and you'll see the levels on the screen change to reflect that. But I better shut up because it's my voice that's triggering it at the moment. Okay, now I'll just stop there. Now you could see that when I was getting into that little area marked OK just here, the next button started flashing and this signal level is OK here started flashing to imply that I was in the happy zone. Now I was actually getting quite loud there in the control room, probably louder than I thought I should be. So I might just mosey over and turn up the mic preamp so it will get louder sooner. Okay, I've just put another 4 dB on that. And now we'll run this again and see where we are. Okay, so we're comfortably in the OK zone now. And that's telling us that's fine. No complaints as far as the software is concerned. It can do its job right at that level. Now it's really important here to make sure you don't turn up your mic pre too hot. You want to get the cleanest, most accurate signal you can. You don't want any distortion. You don't want any artifacts or harmonics involved. Now only you can do that for your own mic preamp and that might even involve recording what you're hearing and making sure it plays back cleanly but if you know your preamp well enough, if you know the meters or the LEDs on there and you know where they should be reading, you should be pretty safe. Just get a nice clean recording and obviously make sure it's not too loud in your control room and that your speakers and monitoring setup can handle it from that perspective as well. So let's assume we're happy now, we've got a great tested level, it's all coming out okay. So we're going to say next. Now this is where we start taking the actual measurements. Now you must take a minimum of 12 measurements, as it says here. A minimum of 12 measurements is required, see the user manual. So you need to do this because ARC makes its money by analyzing from several different positions. This is how it's able to give you a result that's actually much more accurate across your entire room. So in spite of the fact that they want a minimum of 12 measurements, they do strongly suggest you go beyond that and in fact recommend more 16 to 20 type measurements. Now, it does get a bit finicky because if you have a look at some of these diagrams now, you can see the scope of some of the measurements that are recommended by IK, depending on the size of your control room. Now, in my case, I've got the sort of control room where I've got the listening position right in front of the console as normal, but then an equipment rack not far behind me, and then a client couch not far behind that. So it's actually quite a distance between the listening position and the back of the room. And on top of that, I know that the back of my room booms quite heavily from bottom end build up. So when I first measured my room, I actually was not happy with the results I was getting. And after contacting IK, they did recommend not using that profile after all, and using a profile that was more focused to just my listening position, and perhaps to make a second profile at the back of the room on the client lounge that maybe just catered for that one. And that seems to make more sense. I've had much more luck since doing that. The response in the main monitoring position became much more focused. So having a look at some of these diagrams now that are going past you, you can see some of the options that IK recommends. You can see in these diagrams that number one is always the main monitoring position, front and center, exactly where you want to be sitting. So you always start with that main monitoring position as number one, and the other ones create nice little patterns fanning out from that, as you can see.
Now, it wouldn't make too much sense for me to do this now because you're not going to be able to hear improvements in my room, but I will just go through one and two steps just so you can see. So let's say we've got our microphone now in the right position, position number one, and it's going to blast the left speaker, then it's going to blast the right speaker, and then it will stop and prompt me for the next one. So let's have a look. Okay, and you can see here this little arrow moved from one to two. Number one's filled out, implying that we've finished that step, and we move on to arrow two. So just one more, but I'm sure you get the idea. And of course I would have moved the microphone in between those two steps, trying as close as I can to conform to the picture. So naturally now we would continue to do that through 3, 4, 5, 6, up to at least 12, according to YK's recommendation hopefully more, maybe 15 to 18. Now because of the situation I've got myself into here, I can't actually go forward until I've completed at least 12, so I'm going to do that now and I'll join you back in a second. Okay, so here we are about to do number 12. And we'll go from here. And now the next button should become available. And there we go. So of course it's still prompting me to go on with 13, 14, 15. But we'll just say that's it for now. I'll hit next. And as you can see, calculating correction. Now this wasn't a real thing, I've left the microphone in the same position, so there won't be any responsible correction here. Let's just see what it comes up with anyway. Right, now it's prompting me for a measurement name, so I think we'll call that test, and maybe ignore, so I don't get confused by that one. Test ignore. Now here we can get a little picture of various types of monitors to reflect the ones that we're correcting, so there's ones that look suspiciously like Adams and you can get various other things here. There's some big soffit mounted ones. Now these are just pictures for our own amusement and or identification purposes. They don't affect the sound or performance of ARC in any way. So in effect, don't feel any compulsion to match your speakers if you can't find something that looks like them. So just looking at some of these icons of the more popular speaker types. Three-way Genelex, big fellas. So yeah, your Mackies, your NS10s, all that sort of thing. Transmission line to PMCs, it looks like. Basic Dynaudios, which look not dissimilar to the ones I've got in this room. So maybe I'll just leave that. But I've already got other corrections based on those. So I might pick something unique that I haven't got, like a big old Tannoy. I've got nothing that looks like that. So I'll hit Next. And it says the measurement has been saved and is ready for the ARC plugin. So we're pretty much done now, unless we want to take another set of measurements with different speakers or maybe focusing on a different position of the room. But let's just say we're done. So that's the measurement phase, and I'll see you in the next movie.